Welcome. Is the brain the right size? That's the question. But uh, before answering that question, I'd like to consider another question. Who makes the decisions around here? To see whether the brain is in fact important. Is it the brain or the mind? Who is the puppet and who is the puppeteer? This second question has social, legal, and religious implications. If the mind controls the brain, then there is free will and its corollaries, dignity and responsibility. You are the king in your skull-sized kingdom. You are the architect of your destiny. If, on the other hand, the brain controls the mind, an insensitive conclusion follows. There can be no free will, no praise, no retributive punishment, no purgatory, and little hope for survival. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that I have a problem with my image. As an atlas uh, a maker, uh, I have been working now for 45 years in this domain. Uh, I met uh, recently a lady who, uh, when the first atlas uh, from my laboratory came out, uh, she did her PhD on it. And uh, uh, she said, George Paxinos? I thought you were dead. Uh, on another occasion, I uh, was giving a talk at uh, Munich, and one uh, girl asked another, did you see Paxinos? Yes, it is on my shelf. We started our work with the rat, and published a book, The Rat Brains, The Rodaxic Coordinates. But uh, no sooner we got some confidence uh, in working uh, with the rat brain that we lost our confidence that the rat brain is the final frontier. And we thought of attempting uh, to do an atlas of the human brain. Uh, however, even before that, we thought we might as well try to do an atlas of uh, another primate brain because we can obtain a brain, for example, from a chimpanzee at short periods post-mortem uh, without having suffered uh, any degeneration and uh, study it better, do, do a bit better work on it, and then proceed with the human brain. And um, uh, I didn't have uh, a image of a chip and Z, but here we have an orangutan, and you can see externally how similar they are to us. Internally, they are also uh, quite uh, similar. Uh, I wrote to the Toronto Park Zoo back in uh, uh, 1985 to uh, give me the opportunity to do a post-mortem on a chimpanzee brain once a chimpanzee died. They responded that they would be happy to oblige, but they had not had the death of a chimpanzee in the zoo for a decade. Two months after receiving my letter, three chimpanzees died. Luckily, they didn't suspect me. I studied the brain of uh, one of them, and uh, the brain stem, uh, where uh, we did our work, uh, is uh, very similar. In fact, we did not find uh, a difference in uh, the areas that we can detect in the human brainstem and uh, in the chimpanzee brainstem. And we got, of course, uh, a lot of ideas by studying the chimpanzee under more optimal conditions. The primate brain that we studied uh, most closely has been the marmoset, uh, the, the brain of the marmoset. And uh, the marmoset is the size of a small rat. Uh, but it has a primate brain, and it has uh, about the same areas as the human brain. Uh, there's very few areas that uh, seem to be different. Uh, by and large, it's uh, the same plan. Uh, uh, unlike the rat, the cortex of uh, uh, the marmoset is very, very similar to the uh, human and to the rhesus monkey. Uh, and here, we, I show you here a a side view of the cortex of the outside of uh, the brain of a marmoset. And it's virtually the same thing that one finds in uh, the human uh, cortex. Uh, we are attempting to do maps of the human uh, uh, cortex. We've done one uh, uh, here on the, uh, shown on the right, uh, but we're not uh, happy yet that uh, it is uh, as accurate as it should be. The subcortex, the remaining of the brain, 
who are satisfied that that's the best we can do, but the cortex who have not done a good job yet. Uh, and there are other scientists, of course, working on such things, including uh, workers in China at the bottom left. Uh, and they might uh, well go far uh, 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 further than us. Uh, we are trying now with a new method uh, to establish uh, the organizational pattern of the, of the brain, uh, and that is the MRI, and uh, we'll collaborate with uh, other scientists at Duke University in this occasion in the United States, uh, where we can study the connectivity even of the human brain, and you can see here uh, the different pathways in uh, the brain stem of the human in uh, different colors. Now, <coughs> uh, the uh, brain and its importance. The first uh, um, elo uh, eloquent uh, description of what the brain does uh, was uh, given by Hippocrates in 460 to 377 BC. Astoundingly modern view of the brain. Men ought to know that from the brain and from the brain only arise our pleasures, joys, laughter, and jests, as well as our sorrows, pain, griefs and tears. Today is Valentine's Day, and if you were to go to Bondi Junction, uh, you would find a lot of uh, cards uh, dedicated to this day uh, with hearts on them. Uh, all of these about 300 cards that you see here have uh, uh, hearts, uh, at least one red heart, usually a lot more. None of them has the brain on them. And that uh, uh, made me, a couple of years ago, to write an article uh, in uh, the conversation. Darling, I love you from the bottom of my brain. And I received a call from uh, ABC, and the lady journalist asked me, are you saying that uh, the heart has nothing to do with love? I said, if in a heart transplant, I received your heart, I would not fall in love with your husband. She said, what a pity, because he's such a lovely guy. Uh, for the next Valentine's Day, uh, please write to me and I will send you a card uh, with the diagram of the brain, uh, which not only will be equally beautiful, but will be also correct. After a battle to, to localize the seat of the soul, psychology loses its soul in the 1930s. Heb, the mind is the integration of the activity of the brain. Patricia Churchland, there is no ghost in the machine. For scientific considerations, if the soul is where emotion and motivation reside, where mental activity occurs, sensations are per perceived, memories are stored, reasoning takes place and decisions are taken, then there is no need to hypothesize its existence. There is an organ that already performs these uh, functions. So, psychologists think that there is no need for the soul. Uh, but is there a free will? Uh, many neuroscientists, best expressed by B.F. Skinner, believe that behavior is the result of two and only two factors, and we have no choice over either of them the genetic endowment, we do not choose our parents, the environment, we do not choose the society we were born in or whether our mother smoked. And uh, this means, as uh, here, uh, Phidias sculpted out of Parian marble this uh, statue of Apollo in uh, the temple of Zeus in Olympia, so does the environment sculpt our behavior from the genetic material we are granted. As Praxiteles sculpted Hermes, so does the environment molds, forms our character. So, there is no freedom, according to many neuroscientists. Of course, it's quite possible that uh, these neuroscientists, they might, they might be the majority now, are incorrect. And the minority is correct. In science, it's hard to prove anything. Uh, but even the ones who think that there's freedom, that there's some free will, it's really freedom light. 
קוקה קולה לייט, פרידום לייט. The argument that Koch gives, who actually believes that there is some, some minuscule of uh, uh, modicum of free will, he says, our brain is the riverbed that, more, that holds and channels our stream of consciousness. It is molded by the family and the culture we're raised in. There is nothing, and uh, now one can infer that there is nothing left for free will to explain once you account for nature, nurture, and random influences on behavior. If so, this would render us passive observers of the thoughts and emotions that the brain parades for us with no crack for free will to elbow in and join the parade. From the above hypothesis follows a prediction. If any of uh, the men who hear me now were born in a country where they stone women for allegedly burning their holy books, they would be equally likely to participate in the stoning as the men born there now. So the question is to what extent our preference arrived at freely or are forced on us by genetic predispositions, epigenetics, environmental factors totally outside of our control? Are we the authors of our desires? Do we even have the freedom to abandon undesirable desires? It seems there is no free will in the domain of romantic love. In the words of Carmen in the opera by the same name, l'amour il n'a jamais, jamais connu des lois. Love has never, never known the law. Some scorned lovers state emphatically they want to lose their love but cannot. They keep loving someone who has abandoned them or even abusive to them. Some are more capable of committing suicide than switching their affection from one who does not love them to one who does love them. This absence of free will in emotions consistent with Voltaire's more Catholic comment, I cannot help wanting what I do want. Albert Einstein wrote, I do not believe in the freedom of will. Schopenhauer's words, man can do what he wants, but he cannot will what he wants, accompany me in all situations of life. They reconcile me with the actions of men even when they are rather painful to me. Alzheimer's disease will pay an unwelcome visit to most of us at the end of life. It will disrupt the internal structure of our neurons and we will be living evidence the mind is the product of the brain and has no influence on it. The 19th century uh, poet Lord Alfred Tennyson was half right when he wrote in Ulysses, I am a part of all that I have met. The other half of the truth lies in genetics. Neuroscientists agree, genes confirm predilections. Many consider the environment is the only sculptor of behavior. If only we could abandon our undesirable desires, our depression, our obsessions, our compulsions, our unrequited love. If only we are the authors of our thoughts and not mere observers of what the brain presents us. If only the puppet could get hold of one of the strings with which the brain makes it dance. It seems the puppet is free in as much as it loves its strings, Harris. Now, uh, this is not just academic uh, interest. Uh, it's not just the talk of uh, aristic philosophers. It's, it would lead to quite a different approach to crime and punishment. There would be no reason for retributive justice, no hate. Uh, if only scorned lovers came to my lecture, they might be not as likely at the moment. What happens is that um, more than 50% of those who are abandoned in love interfere with the person who abandoned them in their house, in their work, on the internet. Some of them hit them. Some of them kill them. Some of them commit suicide. If only they uh, could see that uh, the person who abandoned them could no more love them than they could uh, abandon their own love for this person. And uh, 
as it concerns neuroscience and free will, uh, I think that Jesus was one of the first to observe that there is no freedom. Uh, on the cross, he said, uh, they don't know what they are doing for those who crucified him, which suggests that he uh, implied that if only they had been with us to listen to us, they would be like us, and it is not their fault that they are crucifying uh, me. So, are we the slaves of yesterday? Definitely, we are the slaves of yesterday. But today is the yesterday of tomorrow. And uh, the uh, psychologist can assist people to change their behavior. Behavior is not immutable. You're part of the environment. Your environment can change you. Uh, and uh, we need to consider the brain in the context. I, I, I trust that you would have agreed with me by now that the brain is important. And the question then, is the brain the right size? It has to be taken seriously. Is it the right size for survival? And what are the limitations of it? And uh, do we have the know thyself uh, that the ancients uh, used, to, used to insist uh, on? Uh, and they, to avoid uh, the following Homo sapiens, intelligence made them extinct. And the question of is the brain the right size? I have an answer. If the brain was smaller, less clever, and capable of language than what it is, it would not have been able to produce the science and technology which today threaten existence. If the brain was larger than what it is, humans might have been able to comprehend the problem, even rectify it. The brain is just not the right size. And uh, here we see us, uh, well, we see Phaethon uh, depicted falling from the sky, but uh, the hubris that we show to nature, to the gods, if you like, to nature, is equally large. Uh, that uh, Phaethon was, uh, grabbed the reins of the chariot of the sun, and Zeus was, uh, that was the task of Apollo, and Zeus was really upset with him and struck him down. Uh, and the humans uh, are uh, about to sustain a similar fall, except if we understand who, what we are, to know thyself. And armed with the truth that we don't know why we are here, that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, paleolithic emotions, that uh, we have a brain that's made up in part by leftovers of uh, the reptilian period, uh, that uh, we have uh, no free will, maybe not even a soul, and that we have a technology which threatens our own existence and uh, that of uh, the other uh, beings on the planet, we might, with that truth in mind, uh, change course and set our stern to the dawn and make wings of our oars. Thank you.